And we're live. Hey everybody, my name is Eric Larkin with Real Brokers. I appreciate you tuning in to another episode of the Florida Live. Tonight, it's all about short-term and vacation rentals. We're going to talk about what's happening here locally in Cocoa Beach and, of course, uh, Palm Beach, Miami, and Boca Raton as well. And if this is your first time tuning in, as I just said a moment ago, my name is Eric Lark and I am a real estate agent here in Cocoa Beach on the Space Coast. And besides doing regular videos like this, I do help people buy and sell real estate. So if you plans of making a move here in Brevard County, I'd love to hear from you. And if your plans are to move somewhere else in the state, I have some great connections for you, like Amy Burroughs in Palm Beach. Hector Chania from Miami and Michelle Balasari from Boca Raton. Thank you everybody for being here tonight. How's everybody doing? Not bad. Yay. Yay, excellent. Michelle, I didn't think you were gonna make it. You finally came in here, huh? So sorry. Um, it's all I'm good. On the phone uh, in regard to a home inspection. <laughs> oh, excellent. Doing your J-O-B. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. And hopefully it lined up and everything will be going well. Hector, you doing yeah. all right tonight? Doing okay. Uh, just had a closing, um, which was very nice. It went above asking. And uh, of course, there's an issue with the package and some verbiage, but I think it'll be taken care of by tomorrow. It all works itself out. Always and good. Amy, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. All is awesome. good. I'm excited to have Travis on here to... Uh, Tell us all about the short-term rentals and how fabulous they are and how fabulous he is. So, And that is a great segue. So who is this guy that's joining us this week that hasn't been here before? This is Travis, and he and his beautiful wife run a company called iTrip. And I'm going to let him explain to you what iTrip is, but he manages short-term rentals. And I will tell you firsthand that I – utilize his services and they are fabulous. I mean, above and beyond. Um, and we can get more into that later on, but Travis, I'm going to give the uh, mic over to you right now and just explain to everyone who you are and what you do. And um, we'll go from there. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. And Amy, thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, I, I'm, as Amy said, my wife and I, my wife Karen and I, uh, own and operate iTrip Vacations Treasure Coast, which is a franchise. So we operate in the Treasure Coast from uh, northern Palm Beach uh, County all the way up through uh, St. Lucie County. And we offer full service uh, short term rental management. So when we talk about vacation rentals and you talk about people that own a, own a property, but they, um, they use it for some of the year and not for the rest of the year and don't know what to do with it. They typically end up uh, at our doorstep and we help them out and we manage everything for them because if they live in Michigan, they really can't be involved in any of the day-to-day -day part of the operation. So we, we take it on for them. And when I say we take it on, we take on everything from, you know, getting the listing ready, getting the house rent ready, but also setting up the license and taxes. And we can get into the details of that because that alone is, is daunting. But uh, working with all the municipalities, uh, working with all the guests, getting the, uh, the guests and, um, and managing their expectations and their experience, managing the property, but also the pricing. When you think about, you know, it's not you're not putting a. The, the, the house out once you're putting it out every single day at a different price based on the supply and demand characteristics of the market so there's a lot that goes into that so we manage all of that uh, for the guests or, or excuse me for the owners so that all they have to do is really collect a disbursement once a month and uh and everything else is on our shoulders to take care of and we enjoy doing sounds it. pretty easy like easy money mm -hmm. yeah. that's, right. well, that's the way we try to make it that way yeah Perfect. So are you specifically all short-term rentals? Like how, how long of a length of rental periods do you usually work with, with your investors? Yeah, well, it's a good question. So I'm outnumbered three to one here with realtors and mm -hmm. realtors, you know, you guys are uh, obviously operating a long-term market uh, on a regular basis, uh, long-term rentals. And the, and the state defines short and long-term by the 180 day mark. So anything up to 180 days is considered short term. Anything that's above 180 days is considered long term. There's some different characteristics of that. For example, you have to evict somebody in a long term lease. You trespass somebody in a short term lease. Big, big difference because because the person that's 
in a short term lease is considered a transient tenant versus a, um, a long term tenant. So um, that, you know, there, there's certain residential rights that a long term tenant gets over over a, a transient tenant. That's that's pretty interesting. I didn't realize that. I know um, definitely with a long term tenant, if, if somebody's not paying the rent or you need to get them out, you have to go eviction and you either need to have a good attorney that you know to handle it or be very have a very good property manager that can handle that as well. Yeah. And there are there are a lot of distinctions between the short and the long term rental that uh, um, it's really important to understand, because a lot of times I would imagine as a realtor, you get people that show up um, and say, hey, I want to buy uh, my vacation home. Uh, I'm not going to live there all the time. Um, and in the course of, of working with them to help them find the home, you you might take it on as a realtor and say, you know, I'll manage the short term side of it. And there's there's a lot to that because it's not. It's not the same market as a long term. It's furnished. There's a lot of maintenance that, that's on your shoulders. You collect up front. You have to pay all the taxes. Um, the, the cleaning and the turns are a lot more significant and a lot more often. Um, so th there's there's a lot that goes into it besides uh, getting a listing up. Excellent. And um, I do have a couple of questions, but really quick. Elizabeth Painter from Cocoa Beach, thank you very much for tuning in on Facebook. We have an old friend of mine. We went to high school together. Actually, Gina Watkins is checking in from Arizona and another local realtor here, Marissa. Um, thank you all for checking in here tonight. Um, you had mentioned a few times already th about the taxes, the taxes, the taxes. What kind of taxes are involved with these short term rentals? Um, and can you break that down a little more? Absolutely. And this is a really important topic because it's very confusing depending on literally what city you're, you live in. Um, but, it, but it basically goes like this. If the first thing you have to do when you're going to have any rental less than 180 days is have a license to do short term rentals. And that license is different than a realtor having a license to do uh, to do realty. It's it's actually given by a completely different um Division. It's given by the DBPR, the Division of uh, Business and Professional Regulation. And um, so, so they issue the license to the manager or the owner. And then uh, you have to apply for your state sales tax certificate. And that each county has a certificate that you'd have to get. And then you, there's a surtax that you have to submit in addition to that sales tax, depending on which county you're in. So for example, uh, Palm Beach and uh, St. Lucie County are at uh, 6% and Martin County, uh, or excuse me, is a, is a 1% surcharge and Martin County is a, a 0.5% uh, surcharge. So you got to know those and, and, and set up to collect those taxes. And then at the county level, you have to pay your tourist development tax. So you have to get a county tax. That gets you the, the, the transactional tax part. Then in addition to that, uh, each county and municipality may uh, require a business tax receipt. So you get a local business tax receipt um, to, to um, and, and you, that's just the fee that you pay once a, uh, once a year to, uh, to maintain that, that receipt. Interesting. So I, I know locally here in Brevard County, it's a 12% tax on short-term rentals, which I um, pretty it's for the state and for the county. And I'm not aware of the local, like the cities that might charge extra on that to do the short terms. I just know it's like rent plus 12%. Right. So, so the 12% is going to be your 6% sales tax and your 6% tourist development tax. What, what I don't know for your county, because I'm not, I don't operate up there, is is whether or not there's a surtax. So that's something that the Department of Revenue would let you know is, is what the surtax is per county. And that gets added to the sales tax when you submit sales tax each month. Interesting. Um, really quick, Caitlin Burroughs, thank you once again for tuning in. She's like a fan. She's here every week. So thank you, Caitlin. You kind of know her, don't you, Amy? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I know her too. Oh, look at that. Caitlin's a rock star. Yes, yes she, she is. Yes, she is. Yeah. All right, so here, Hector, I think you had a question. I saw it in the comments. I did have a question, and it was regarding the maintenance. You know, what are common issues that you find when you're maintaining an Airbnb when it comes to, you know, HVAC and, you know, anything with, with air conditioning and things like that? H how do you handle that whenever you an issue comes up? That's a good question. If, if you're asking me specifically how I do it, it's, it's all about being proactive. So every time we onboard a property, 
we, we go through and we look at the HVAC system and the age, we make sure that we have a service contract and we also put a maintenance plan together. So we change the filter every, every month, every two months, we, we, um, clear the, the drain, the AC drain and, and put detergent in it, things like that. The water heater, uh, depending on the age of the water heater, you can put a maintenance plan together for that. So you always want to drain any kind of sediment out of the bottom of a water heater to extend its life. Uh, sink toilets, if, if a house, one, one big problem you have with a short-term rental is if, if it's September and you're not getting bookings because everybody's afraid of hurricanes, then the house sits vacant. And when it's vacant, um, there's things that the house needs to have exercised or else things go bad. For example, the plumbing, if you don't flush the toilets and run the water, uh, you know, once a week, then, then you, the pressure gets low sediment gets, um, deposited in those pipes. And then when you turn the water back on that sediment goes into the cartridge for the, the faucet and then the water doesn't work. So there's just maintenance that like care and feeding that you have to do to a house. That's all proactive. You do that so that, the guest doesn't have to find the problems. That's the, the goal is to never have a guest have one of those issues. Great. Thanks for your input. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, so you had mentioned municipalities have their own type of licensing or registration for the short-term rentals. Hmm. Is that like an annual thing or is it, is it a one and done type thing? Yeah, it, it's a it's a bit of a can of worms. So, um, so let's go to a different level and talk about it first. Okay. There's there's every property owner has a right to rent. It's it's part of being a property owner. Um, you, you're given that right when you buy the property. Now you can voluntarily give that right up if you live in a restricted deed or an HOA. Okay. The state has a preemptive uh, rule in place that says that. Renting your property is a property owner's right, regardless of duration, and it's a it's a residential use. Those are key words because those words are up for challenge right now. So every year there's some sort of a challenge to that where we're, they're saying we want to take those property owner rights away at the municipal level and, and, and either regulate it based on the duration or regulate it based on making it a commercial use versus a residential use. So try to change the terms of that right. So that's a battle back and forth between uh, municipalities and the state about who gets to make those decisions. Um, where it stands right now is there is a preemptive um, rule in place at the state level, law in place in the state level, that says that municipalities can't regulate it unless they had something on the books prior to 2011, okay? So what they can do is they can make you register. So what you'll see there's, I believe there's 36 or, or so uh, municipalities in Florida that have some form of a registration process. Now they can't tell you, you can't do a vacation rental through the registration process, but they can charge you a fee to do it. And they can require you to, to meet certain code um, um, enforcement uh, statutes. The thing is they can't, they can't have a, a vacation rental owner or short-term rental owner uh, work by a different set of codes than any other vacation or than, than any other homeowner would. So, in other words, if if you can, uh, if you have to have you know parking for uh, you know a car for every bedroom in the house, then you know, then nobody has that code. I'm just making that up. But if they did that, they, it would have to be for everybody in the municipality, not just the people operating a vacation rental. But they have the right to enforce the codes and, and inspect and all of that too. They just can't discriminate against you based on the duration of your rents. That's interesting. And now, if a municipality had um, something on their books that would uh, minimize the, like how often or where you can rent a property, that had to have been in place for some time. That's something that they can't change here yeah. in in today's laws, right? That, that, that's right. There's a grandfather um, of it. The wool had to be on the books by t before 2011. Now, some municipalities have gone ahead and tried to do it anyway, and they're they're testing the 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 um the wool because it's hard for an individual to fight the municipality, um, and and lose. So they can you know it's it gets caught up in courts and stuff like that. So that's happened a couple of times, but, but, you know, those are the laws and uh, as it stands right now. And like I said, registrations can be expensive. For example, Fort Pierce just implemented one a year ago. And, um, you know, you have to follow all the same codes that uh, every other homeowner does, but you have to pay $600 a year as a registration fee, which is pretty expensive considering, you know, 
about 80%, more than 80% of the, the short-term rentals in Fort Pierce are two bedroom condos. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are people that that's their vacation home. They're trying to make some money on the side when they're not in it. $600 is a lot of money. Yes, it could be. Mm -hmm. um, do you do short-term rentals in Boca Raton? Was that one of your areas? Uh, it's a little south of me, but I, I trip, you know, speaking about I trip um, with a shameless plug, it, it's a franchise model. So there's franchises that own certain territories. Uh, my, my Southern borders on North Lake uh, Boulevard. And then uh, there's a, I trip uh, Palm beaches that goes south of me from there. So you can take that one. So here's uh, the question. Yeah. I spoke with the city probably last year. Um, and it was an interesting conversation because the, Basically, they were saying, yeah, you can go ahead and do a short-term rental. And we really, are, they for a while there, I think they were really cracking down. But then what, what I was told was, as long as nobody complains about it, you know, we're really not going to do anything. Because the state came out with, you know, laws that overrode the municipality. Now, I'm not a short-term rental specialist. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, yeah. not my niche. So I don't, you know, I'm not as current on these laws and whatnot. And I don't really work with investors that are buying them. But I thought that was an interesting, yeah. you know, an inter interesting observation because if you go on Airbnb, there are certainly plenty of uh, short term rentals here in Boca. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing if people take the tack of, I'm going to wait till somebody finds me and I'm going to do it on my own and I'm not going to pay the taxes and I'm not going to register. Then what they're doing is they're giving municipalities a reason to regulate you mm -hmm. uh, because there's no visibility into the health and safety of, and, and the, um, the quality of the community that you're operating in. But if you're willing to cut those corners, what other corners you're willing to to cut so their imaginations sometimes greater than reality but if you're if you're not going to spend four hours which is what it takes for me to register do all those registrations i talked about every time i get a new property it's about four hours worth of going through the paperwork and making sure i've got every uh, everything correct and getting everything filed if if you're not willing to take four hours to make yourself legal and do the right thing and be above board then you probably should question whether or not you should be in the business because i don't you're gonna think that was the implication i think the yeah. implication was that you had the proper documentation yeah. however the city can't tell you no was the that's true they, they can't tell you no unless there's a code violation and the code violation is if somebody complains, we're going to whack you with code violation. So that was my understanding of how they get around it, but not a homeowner or, you know, homeowner uh, getting around the proper paperwork. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, once people start complaining, then you've got an issue where they're going to try to find something. Yeah. And, and it becomes a witch hunt. So and, and in that case, yeah, you're right. You, even if you're doing everything above board, if somebody does that to you um, and, and really wants it wants to make that their their goal, then that's something that you got to go up against. And the best thing to do is if you're going to do a short term rental, have a code inspector come out to the house, look at the house, tell me, hey, what's and you, do you see anything? Because that now that goes in your favor. You've got a document of uh, yeah, I had the code guys come out here before I started this to make sure this wouldn't happen. What else could I possibly do to be responsible? Excellent. And here we got a comment here from David Brooks from LinkedIn. David, thank you for tuning in, man. Um, Airbnb collects taxes and rents them and remits them automatically to the state. So yeah. that's something that Airbnb does. Is this it's, something similar to like VRBO? And I understand it, you as a property manager, you would do this too. Yeah. So here's here's the thing. Airbnb, they they're they they manage that transaction. They don't pay the tourist development tax though. So what that means is they're paying some of your tax, but not all of it. They don't pay the surcharge or the 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 tourist development tax. So what a, a lot of people get involved or get in trouble with when they're just operating on the Airbnb platform is they think they're good because the taxes are being paid at the state level for the sales tax but they're not registered uh, with a, a tourist development tax account at the county level, and they're not paying those. Now, I say that, but I will tell you, it's kind of confusing because it goes county by county 
on what Airbnb does and doesn't pay and remit. So that's one of the things that if you're going to be on the Airbnb platform, it's really important to know this is a county I'm in and this is what they do in my county. It happens to be in the counties that I'm in. They don't submit the the, um, the, the county tax. They only submit the, the state tax. Okay. So that would that be somebody, if somebody's using the Airbnb here in Cocoa Beach, like I'm pretty certain David is, um, does he need to follow up with, with them to see what if they're paying that tax or not? Because ultimately he's still responsible for it, correct? Yeah, he, he'd be responsible for it. So you definitely want to make sure, you know, first start with Airbnb and say, are you paying my tourist development tax? And if they're not, then yeah, get registered with the, with the county and start paying the tax. And it's, you know, it's tricky because you have to collect the tax from the tenant. So it's very important to know what it is. And, and in Airbnb, as in other platforms, all the other platforms, you can set those taxes up so that they're automatically added to, um, you know, to the transactions. But your, your responsibility is to collect them from the tenant and pay them to the municipalities. So, for example, on that, if we know in Brevard County it's not happening through Airbnb, is there a way as an owner in the system to have that added on to make certain that it's collected? Or is that something outside yeah. of that they have to do? It's very, it's easy to do, it, it, um, it's easy to set up. It's, it's scary to people, because it's kind of like accounting. And accounting is really addition and subtraction. It's not that hard, but it, the, the, the idea of having to file your taxes is, is you know, stressful. And it's the same thing for this. It's really not that hard. It's stressful though, to know that you gotta do it. Excellent. Travis, uh, I just looked here and Going back to talking about the penalties and getting certifications and things like that, for instance, Miami Beach has a major war going on right now with short-term yeah. rentals and Airbnbs. It's huge. There And there are people that are doing it without being licensed or yeah. they're not getting the right licensing for there's a fire fee, an application fee, a resort tax uh, fee. Their first, for the first offense, it's a $20,000 fine. I mean, can you imagine being a short-term renter or, uh, you know, somebody that owns a short-term rental property and you have to pay $20,000 for your first fine and then it goes up increasing by $20,000. Yeah. I mean, this can bankrupt you if you don't do it right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the legislative fights at the state level are, are usually started in Miami. It's the, you know, the, the politicians in Miami that are trying to write the bills that, that oh, at the state level to, to get rid of that. But what I would say in that is, if you're not, if you don't have all your ducks in a row, then and and they catch you, then that's what that's what you're responsible for. What I'd be interested in, and I don't know the answer to this, but I would be interested in knowing if anybody tried to get their ducks in a row, made the honest college try, getting everything together, if they ever got that fine. You know, is the city just being vindictive, or, or are they realizing, okay, well, you tried, you know, you missed this step, but I see you did everything else. Let's help you out and get you on board. I've experienced that with the municipalities. Um, it, I, it's, I, I do this all the time. I do it for a living. This is my job. And every once in a while, I get something screwing, and I call the tax collector, and they are great about helping me out. I've never had a problem with any of the tax collectors, uh, and at the state level and at the county level, um, the, the offices have been wonderful about helping you get compliant so i would encourage people if you're going to do it make the phone call you know and, and that's on the record then with, that you called in and said i want to do it right help me do it right and, and they'll be more than happy to help you right here i mean here if you're proactive for the most part they're going to work with you the two major cities that are are creating this you know it's you, you against us type thing is coral gables and miami beach those are the two that you know the people in coral gables um, there, you're not allowed to do short-term rentals um, mm -hmm. in any part of Coral Gables, and 76% of Coral Gables is residential, and they're beautiful homes. I mean, I get that, but they're not allowing it at all. And on the beach, it's out of control. I mean, there's people doing it left and right; they're not supposed to. So I think I, I would venture to say that if you're trying to be proactive and you're showing the the initiative of doing it correctly, they're probably going to work with you more than say, "Hey, no, this is you against us." You know, get your guns out and get and get your wallet out and start paying because, at the end of the day, it's revenue for the for the city or the municipality. So yeah. they're going to look at it that way. I mean, you you bring up a great point. I'm I'm involved with um, the Florida Alliance of Vacation Rentals, um, 
and and one of the things that we've heard is people say, you know, who are they to, to you know tell us and, and want to know what we're doing and get you know get our revenue backs and make us pay tax? They're the municipality that you're operating in, and they they do have a certain right to collect those taxes, and you have a responsibility to abide by the laws. And and if you don't, then you you're open yourself up to uh, whatever fines come your way for that, and it sets a you become the story for why they want more regulation. If everybody just followed the rules, there's, I just listed out at the beginning of this call, tons of regulation. We're, it's not like we need more regulation. We need more compliance. If we had more compliance, there wouldn't be a problem. Right. I agree. hundred percent. All right. Um, really quick. If y'all are watching either live or on the replay, thank you very much for tuning in. If you can just drop a comment in there, the city that you're watching it from and whether it's on the replay. And since we're talking short term rentals and vacation rentals, please drop your questions there because we obviously have an expert here with Travis. That's that's bringing us a lot of knowledge about the short term rental short term rental market. Please drop your comments down there. Let's see what I got. Um, so obviously, if you own a property, you're going to have to have some type of insurance on it. Um, what What about those who are guests in there? Is there any type of insurance that they need if they're staying at an Airbnb or some type of vacation rental? I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question because this is a, uh, a very um, lesser known thing with insurance. And when, when somebody buys a property and has the intent of going, using it as a short-term rental, there's a special kind of insurance for short-term rental. And if you don't get that insurance on your rider and you just get a normal homeowner policy or even a long-term rental policy, and you have a claim that is a result of damage from a short-term rental, they won't cover it because you don't have the right coverage. So um, it's very important that you talk to your an agent or an underwriter and make sure they understand you're using it as a short-term rental. And they usually want to know that the minimum duration. So is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Those matter because they, um, in some cases they won't even underwrite the, the dailies. Right. A lot of times, you know, weeklies is as right. uh, far as they go. But, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to a potential uh, customer uh, and a homeowner and going through, you know, what does it take to be rent ready? I always tell them, talk to your, your insurance guy first. And let's make sure you understand and have the right policy set up there or understand what it's going to cost before we move forward. Because even though you might have a beautiful property on the beach, that the fact that it's on the beach and it's in a flood zone and all that, and you're going to use it as short-term rental piles up so much that the insurance may not even make sense or you can't get underwritten. So insurance is a really important factor to think of up front when you're considering this business. How many options are out there for that type of short-term rental insurance? Because I know just buy somebody looking to buy a, a regular house or even a second home for themselves that have no intentions of renting it. It's difficult in Florida to get insurance. Are there a few options for them out there? There are, but it's, it's for the same reason you cited, it's getting harder and harder. So um, there's a very short list. There's four uh, underwriters that I'm aware of that, that still under, underwrite short-term rentals in Florida, but they have conditions that they'll look for. So you, you have to fit in the in what they're looking for in their portfolio or, or they won't cover you either. Got it. Let's see. Hector, you said you had a question? I do. I do have a question. So Travis, I have a cabin in North Carolina. It's, uh, it's in a little town um, in Maggie Valley, which is about 30, 40 minutes from Asheville. And so you know, with the cabin, we have a policy that is through State Farm for the cabin for the cabin itself. And then we also have per rental, we pay a small percentage to get a million dollars of coverage, which is more than enough money to replace the cabin without a problem. Mm -hmm. How does that work here? Because I, I don't know how it works here in Florida. I, I think it works the same, but I don't know. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not understanding the question right, but it, it, I think it, it's the same. Yeah. Because what I have there is it's almost like an umbrella policy where it covers anything. I mean, with with that's with um, Airbnb, Turnkey, Picasa, whoever it is. But that um, umbrella is your liability. That's liability only, right? I thought it was liability only, and I'm pretty well, well uh, seasoned 
in insurance because that was my business before real estate. And I can tell you that, um, you know, from what I understand, from what I read, it's like anything. Like if somebody were to burn it down or something like that, that would actually take first in line, even though State Farm probably would. But then I run into the issue of, is it a long-term rental? Is it a short-term rental? And things like that. Yeah. So, no. All right. So, so there's a couple things. There's, if you have a manager, manager's got insurance too. Right. Of course. Right. If, if the liability is on the manager for something that I've done, then it's going to be me before it's your homeowners and, and work your way up. Right. If it's from the tenant, there's a couple of different types of insurance. You can have something called a limited damage waiver, which is essentially like a security deposit. Okay. Um, where the the tenant will pay a non-refundable fee that will cover a um, a limited damage, so up to a certain amount. Um, that usually is good to cover your deductible for your homeowner policy that has a rental provider on it. Okay, that's typically how it works. The umbrellas are liability. So if, if that's all that covers, uh, everything that we just talked about is for the damage to your property. The liability is is somebody gets hurt on your property or something like that. So the, my understanding is the umbrella is it only, per, it, that's only for your liability. It's not for damage from a tenant. Okay. I'm not an insurance guy. I, <laughs> you know, that's just my understanding. I, I, w I was just confused because when I read it, I was like, wait, so why do I need a homeowner's policy except for that? The mortgage company is asking for a homeowner's policy, um, all risk. So I was a little confused. And when I spoke to them, they're like, yeah, you're basically covered for anything. I'm like, but is it just liability or is it liability and property and loss of rents and loss of use and things like that? And they said, yeah, you're covered for everything. So I'm still That's waiting it. to get that paperwork so that I can read it and then maybe even furnish you a copy. Yeah, well, I, I'd be interested because I'm, I'm not aware of umbrellas that are beyond liability. Right. So, cool. That was a good question. Awesome. Yeah. Amy, what do you got? Almost stumped me there, Hector. <laughs> I have a lot of questions for you, Travis. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I guess one of my questions, um, and this will lead into the next question after that. Um, how are you helping real estate agents with their clients that are looking for investments and short-term rentals? Uh, loaded question. So, and, and you know the answer, so because we've done this together. There's a couple of things. Um, I understand the market. I understand um, the occupancy and the rates that, that, that a property can bear. And um, I'm more than happy to help realtors give that information to their, their clients. Um, and, and this is a routine thing where I'll have a, a realtor call me and say, I've got this person. They want to buy a, their second home. They're going to want to use it as a short term rental. Can you help me find a good place for them? And can you help me, uh, you know, help them understand, you know, what the, what the market would bear. So I'll do a pro forma for them that'll give them an idea of how the, the properties would perform, but I also will help them guide them through where they, they should be looking. And it's, some of it is based on what, what the client wants. If they want to be on a golf course or on the ocean or, or, you know, in a community with a pool or something like that, all those things are filter downs, you know, in where you can go. But um, I, I went through a painstaking effort of, looking at every community in my territory, which is well over 1,500 of them, and got their rules and regulations, and I know what's HOA restricted and what's not. Um, and then I put some demographics on each of those things, uh, or not demographics, but metadata about you know golf, uh, water, things like that, so that uh, when, when we get those uh, requirements that the, the homeowner has, I can filter that down and say, hey, look at these spots. And, and see what you've got. And then uh, I can tell you what the market would bear for the, any properties that you come back with. Awesome. Um, so that rolls into my next question for you. And how do you think the market is for these short-term rentals? Yeah. Uh, everybody, this is, the, this is a big question right now and just in general with purchasing and things of that sort. So what are you seeing in that short-term rental investment side? The market right now is, this is the off season in, um, in, in our area and on the treasure coast. Usually the, on the big, the peak seasons, January through March and the shoulders are October leading up to January. And then, you know, April through June, July, August, September is no man's land. 
I'm 90% booked right now. Uh, and I'm about 30% above last year's rates. So would you say this is a great time to purchase investment properties? Yeah. It, it, I think what we're seeing is a couple of things. Um, big change in the market permanently. People with COVID learned how to work remotely. And when they did that and they went stir crazy, they learned how to vacation and still work. So what's happening is people are, are going to another house to, to do what they are doing in their own house. And, uh, you know, it, it, it used to be that you try to get beds in, in a room and, and two twins and stuff like that and try to try to mess with how many uh, headcount you can get. Now you want a, a desk. I'm at a vacation rental that I'm onboarding right now. And there's a desk in the, in the bedroom that I'm sitting at. Because it's table stakes to have take the quietest room in the house and make it an office because people are going to be doing Zoom calls on their vacation. What that has done is those sh the, the seasons and the shoulders and the off season have all um, had an uptick in demand. Not just that, there's a, a really strong demand market just in real estate in general, as you guys know. And people want to come down and, and look and it's hard to find. So what do they do? They stay in short term rentals while they're looking. Not only that, people are seeing the demand and saying, OK, you know, real estate really doesn't go down. So I better buy my my retirement home now. And if, when I do, what am I going to do with it until I retire? Right. So so that's creating a lot of a lot more inventory in the short term market because people are buying these properties and then, you know, using them uh, to generate some income to cover the cost. As a as a um, midlifer. That's definitely an avenue that, you know, people decided to move up their plans by several years because of COVID. So a plan of, oh, we're going to retire to Florida. We're going to buy a second home in Florida became we're doing it now, not like in 10 years. And the work from home piece, I have clients that definitely do that. They have beautiful homes, but they work from home. And it's like, even me, I work from home and I'm like, I love my house. But I'm like, I'm so freaking bored. Like with the decor and I need a different flair, which leads into um, decorating and uh, putting your short-term rental together. And my number one thing is make it Instagrammable. Big time. And so I made a couple notes. Tell me if this is this is all stuff that people should do, Travis. Sure. Have great Wi-Fi. Absolutely. Number one. Absolutely. Number one. Badass Wi-Fi. Have comfy yep. beds. Like super Absolutely. comfy beds. Yep. They um, don't have to be on, on the beds, they don't have to be top of line. You don't have to spend four thousand right. dollars on the bed. But you have to have a comfortable bed. It can't have a dip in it and a little healthy <laughs> dip. If your bed has a dip, it might still be under warranty. Send it back. Um, yeah. Coffee station. I'm a big fan of the coffee station, the Nespresso and the frother and, you know, having that all together. So when I get up in the morning, it's like delish. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on themes? I know in Central Florida with Disney, you see a lot of themed short-term rentals. Yeah. Uh, now, here's where I wish my beautiful wife, Karen, was on the call because she, her and I have completely different opinions on it. And I, I don't believe either of us are wrong. Uh, she thinks themes are, 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 are past and, and people are moving away from it. I love the themes because you're, you've transported yourself into an, someone else's home. And why not transport yourself into another theme? So I actually, I enjoy it and it'll never go out of style with me, but I'm an old guy, right? Uh, but, but with Karen, you know, I think um, she would tell you that depersonalizing is really important because um, people actually don't want to feel like they're staying in another home. What you're having is a migration away from resorts and hotels to private homes. And those people that are in the resorts, there's a certain um, anesthetized feel that you have that they want in that house. And that's what's pulling them away from the, the themes. But like I said, I love the themes. Well, I think having a personalized hashtag, like having a name for your Airbnb, Verbo, short-term yeah. rental is huge because if you want to have people share it and tag you, you want to have something that's 
easy to remember too. And then the other thing is, is having a wall maybe with a little neon sign, you know, so people are doing their photos in front of it, you know, and videos. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's brilliant actually, Michelle. I have a, a couple friends here in, in Cocoa Beach and West or Melbourne Village. One of them, he's got a nice riverfront house in Cocoa Beach and he's nicknamed and branded it Manatee Key. So he's oh, got a, a silhouette of a manatee. He's got stickers that he hands out to folks as they come in and check out. Um, T-shirts are made. So he's definitely has it all branded. And then a friend of mine, she bought a house or their family bought a house and there's a little cottage that they converted into uh, an Airbnb rental or short-term rental. And they branded that Curly's cottage in homage to her mother who recently passed away. So they made like a silhouette of her mom and it's on coffee cups and other things along those lines. Oh, that's and, darling. and I encourage both of them to start your Instagram account so you can start posting things about it and do your own type of promotion through social media. Is that something right. that you're seeing, Travis? Yeah, um, there it, it leads something. So, so what you're talking about are naming a house. Number one, absolutely, we have names on all our houses. But there's another part of that, which is what you're talking about, is when a realtor puts a house up on the market, they're taking pictures, trying to show people where you might want to live. This is the, this is the where you're going to live. When you put pictures up for a short-term rental listing, you're saying, imagine your family experiences that you're going to have in this space right because it's it's the, the decor is what you're going to step into it's not it's not a listing decor that may not may or may not be there because you're going to put your own furniture and this is the furniture you're going to have this is the coffee machine that's going to be there in the kitchen for you you know so you know a lot of a lot of times the people that are booking they're booking for their family and they're when they're looking at the pictures they're saying you know, they're imagining in their head what their kids are going to be doing in that room or, or the, you know, the game night or the movie night or something, whatever they're going to be doing or hanging out at the fire pit in the backyard or whatever it might be. So the listings um, are real important to create that experience and all of the social media extensions that you can do to that for that experience are that way too. A big, a big tip that we give people is to have a photo op somewhere on, on the property or in the house. So that everybody's taking a picture next to the mailbox because you got this cool mailbox or this some totem pole in the backyard or something because now that that is the the memory and that is the experience and that's the reason why they want to come back there every year too. That's yeah. gold. That's a great idea. It it is a great idea, uh, Travis. We actually our cabin is on Copper Spur Road, and it's got a copper roof that we just put on there, so it's copper top cabin, um, and we have. Two really, uh, they started off as little baby pine trees. And in the last, I don't know, nine years, they're huge. So people always take pictures by the pine trees. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, it is a good place for a photo op. Yeah. Good stuff. You should have pine tree. Um, you know how you hang the things from your mirror in your car? Right. With oh, your air fresheners, with, yeah, with your with your hashtag on it, and give them at, like leave them there for people to take with them. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a bad idea. By the way, uh, we wanted to also recognize Nifey. She said she loved the hashtag idea. Hi, Nifey. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for commenting. So, Most yeah. definitely. Our Tampa gal. Yep. So we've talking about some great ideas and things that should that could be happening to help promote an Airbnb. Are there some things that you're seeing that's happening that people just need to stop? What what should they do to what should they stop doing in their short term rental? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, number one, there should never be pictures of people in your photos, <laughs> whether it's intentional or not, um, be, because when people enter your your property they want to feel a sense of new it's a new experience and you take that away from them as soon as you put somebody in the picture mm -hmm. so so never put pick people in the pictures and try to depersonalize as much as possible um if just because something's sentimental to you or has an inside joke to your family or something like that doesn't mean the rest of the people that are going to stay there are going to get that or even even appreciate it but but what you could be doing is you could be setting them off because again they feel like they're in somebody else's house you know you just you want to try to 
take that feeling away that I'm staying in somebody else's house as much as you can and, and insert the, this is your chance for your family to make a great experience. Travis, do, and this may sound kind of silly, but I know that at our family um, homes, we would have books out. Um, we never rented it out to just anybody, but we would have a book at the door. And anytime any of the family members went and stayed there, they would just kind of write like something. Yeah. Does anybody do that? It, that you know, thing? this is one of those things that COVID changed everything. So it used to be that you had a guest book that people would flip through. You'd have games you know, in a closet that people could pull out and you'd have books on a shelf that people could read. And then when COVID came out, um, there were all these COVID cleaning protocols for short-term rentals. Mm. And they were every one of those surfaces had to be cleaned and sanitized on every turn. So there goes the guest book, there goes all the games, there goes all the books. Now that those rules have been relaxed and, and we've gotten back to some sort of normalcy, some of those things are finding their way back. Um, but it's interesting how they're coming back, but people are very um, sensitive to sanitize, sanitizing. So you, the games that you see aren't the board games with all the little pieces that you've got to clean anymore. People are finding more like like the Scrabble game, easy to or not Scrabble, um, the a Boggle game, I think it's called, or something like that. These are uh, Pictionary things that that are big things that you can clean, but not a lot of little pieces. Instead of having a whole book rack full of books, you'll have four or five books, and you know, so people are tapering it back in. It's not like it was before, and the the guest book, everything is covered. Uh, in a plastic covering so that they can be wiped. So it, everything's, it's, it's a lot different now. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't imagine having to clean every tie on a Scrabble no. game. That would uh, drive me bonkers. The week that, that they did the shutdown across the state, that was probably the biggest outdoor. It was, what are we going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> Travis, oh, is there I, an I, online, I, um, uh, is there like an online guest book? Does that exist where people can go online and just sign in there and put in some comments? Yeah, there's there are a couple different um, platforms out there that um, vacation rental owners, short term rental owners um, can look at. I'm not going to name any. I'm not going to give any plugs, but but there are a, you know you can actually have a tablet in the house that has all of the job aids for you know how to work the TVs and how to work the coffee maker, yeah. and the espresso machine, and all that stuff, as well as you know. Post pictures out by the pool or by the, the photo op area or, you know, leak your guest uh, comments or something like that. So, so you can have an interactive experience right on that tablet. And, and that's becoming very popular, yep. uh, almost almost table stakes now. Yep, I see it. I, we have one in ours. We, there's one there where people can leave comments and photos and things like that. So yeah. I love that. I think that just makes it. It's not it doesn't make it it doesn't personalize it per se for the, it just personalizes it for the whole experience. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. neat. It's, it's funny how it takes, you know, a, a crisis or a shortage or scarcity to create a new opportunity, but yeah. that's what, that's what's happened here. And it's not so bad, you know, having it all out there like that. I agree with you. Not bad so, at all. I have a question because I just watched the holiday, <laughs> which if you haven't seen that, it's kind of a chick flick. Um, Cameron Diaz and uh, what's her name from? Oh yeah, Canada. I know which one you're talking they about. Swap houses. Yeah. England, LA. So, do you are you seeing a lot of that? Because that's something I'm thinking about. By the way, it's, yeah, it's a it's a slightly different market, and I don't know that it's actually regulated at all. <laughs> sure and so. it's huge <laughs> in Europe. Um, that, that's a really big thing in Europe. Um, but this house swap thing, because that's really just two people agreeing to stay in each other's houses. It's it's a, a little bit more of a personal transaction. Um, but I, you know, I don't know if there's any regulation at all on that. Well, you know, I'm an empty nester, my husband and I. So I started thinking about the other thing um, I researched, and I talked to uh, the property appraiser's office here. Is I can rent my house out for up to 30 days a year without losing my homestead exemption. Oh. So I'm looking at, you know, I always say like to realtors, like multiple streams of income are a great piece to add to your business. There's no shame in that game. It's smart as an entrepreneur. And I started thinking about it more and I said to my husband, I said, you know, we should consider maybe 
four times a year renting out the house. Hmm. And he's like, I didn't pay him for that. So I'm just like, you know, because where I am in my life, I'm like, that's like a nice little stream of income that could come in. So I'm, I'm investigating it. There I've go. got a question about that. If you're going to do something like that, you had mentioned, per, you know, depersonalizing your house. Is it taboo to, to lock off a room when it's, somebody comes? It's normal. In fact, every property is going to have a locked room. Owner's okay. closet. Yeah, right. exactly right. It's the owner's closet. Our, our garage is uh, air conditioned, believe it or not. Nice. Don't ask why. Um, yeah. But we, we had a place in the Keys for a long time. So we had you know, personal things just kind of locked away. But I love that I, idea of, you know, being able to do that in home swap as well. Yeah, Susan and I have actually been talking about, you know, what if we could do that? And that's a brilliant idea. I like it. Yeah. There's, there's a huge nugget on top of all the other ones that Travis dropped that I can take from this call. <laughs> Travis. Yeah. So, um, if, if we do have an investor, I know Amy asked one of the investor questions a little while ago. So we have somebody that wants to invest for the short-term rentals. Are Do you have a way of looking at um, inventory that's out there and say there's a gap in this type of property? We see this particular type of property that's running really well, and it seems to be low in these, these particular areas. Would that be something that you can do to help us maybe find an investment like that? Yeah, I, I have some tools where I'm able to look at the supply and the demand side in, in inventory right down to the zip code and and that's usually the the level that i'll do the analysis and and i'll be able to see where the demand is versus where the supply is and say you know three bedrooms going to do well a four bedrooms going to do well or in some cases believe it or not a studio a studio is going to get higher demand than a three bedroom because there's so many three bedrooms so it's sometimes it's it's not the way you think of uh when you do that analysis it's not what you would expect Wow. Interesting. Oh, nice. Just, that's fantastic, Nike. Great idea. Yeah. That, that would be nothing but good vibes. Um, Night, um, if you can't read that, Nike Burks had said, I stayed in an Airbnb at Stone Mountain where they had a wall with positive <laughs> notes from guests. If that's, that's not a great cool. testimonial. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, I'd have to read them on every turn to make sure they're all positive. But <laughs> well, plucking the ones that aren't. <laughs> and I'm glad you said that, Travis, because that's where you got to be careful with those books. I mean, we have <laughs> issues, and then people get really upset. They get pissed off, and they leave these comments, and you're like, oh, my yeah. God. So do you tear it out? Do you leave it in? What do you do when you see something like that, Travis? Yeah, well, you know, you can't shy away from criticism. Oh, it's, it's it's an opportunity, and you have to look at it that way. I, I have, I'll have i give you a, a real-life example. I had somebody give me – I've had nothing but five-star reviews, and then I get a three-star review out of nowhere, and it was the beds weren't comfortable. Now, I could I could say something back to that person um, but and, and, and do, hit it directly, but that message isn't really – it, it really doesn't matter of that person right now. It doesn't matter. It's every person that's going to read that review. So all I could do is go buy all new beds and say, we just thank you for that feedback. We have just replaced every bed in the house. Yep, That's what we Perfect. did. There's no other way to deal with, with, with criticism other than just address it head on. Yep. And we also want to um, thank Tim Hoare for his comment. All these realtors are pros. <laughs> that's why we're all here. That's why we're a part of real and we do what we do. Yep. And Tim, he, he was our guest last week. He was the, the lender that gave us some great advice on VA loans and some other things. So thanks for tuning in, Tim. And I see there's a few people that are watching as well. If you'd like to drop in the chat where you're, where you're checking in from, we always like to see uh, across the state or country for folks that are tuning in. We'd greatly appreciate that. What topics would you like us to talk about moving forward? We're always open to your ideas and suggestions. For future you know, calls? Or anybody who's viewing this. If you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And more often than not, a lot of the questions that we get either in the comments for this show, whether it's live or on the replay, um, those, those will be brought, um, those could be future shows. And there's things that we could definitely plan on talking about on future shows too. Um, well, and here's... From Marissa, she's a local real estate agent, and she does property management too. I don't know if she does the just the 
long term or if she has short term as well. But do you know if all iTrip agents offer this service to realtors and do all iTrip agents not sell or work with buyers and are short term rental agents only? If so, how do I find an iTrip agent in our area to refer my clients to? And Marissa is here in Brevard County with me. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, you can go to itrip.net and um, all of our uh, territories are there and you, you in, it's one click away from a property manager that's in that area. So that's how you would find them. Um, they all, we all do the same thing. We're all full service, um, meaning that we, we try to handle everything for everybody. And so for, for your clients, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try to give you guys um you know, good market analysis on properties you're looking at, try to try to guide you into good areas to look for properties and what types of properties are going to do well. Um, and some sometimes uh, an eye tripper would be is a realtor. Uh, we've got a couple of them. There's uh, 100 over 120, I think now. Uh, different franchises out there. And, you know, a handful of them are realtors. For the most part, we're not. The, for the most part, we stick to our knitting and we stay in the short term market. And, and that's all we do. And, and we're a really good complement to realtors. Um, so I, th I think you should always look at iTrip as a uh, as a as a resource um, versus, cool. a, versus a competitor. Definitely have to check to see if you're here in Brevard County, because this is some good information. Um, and Kaylin Christensen has checking in from Iowa. She'd like to know how to get started with short term rentals because they only she's only had long term rentals. So wow. is there an <laughs> so abridged version with, with the four <laughs> minutes left? That's a that's a big one. I mean, there, there, you have a lot of questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, can you furnish a property with high quality furnishings that that are that are going to be durable and that you know, are going to be safe for, for your guests because that's, if it's a long-term rental, it's not furnished. So that's the first thing is you're going to spend a lot of money on furnishings. And that goes right down to how many plates and silverware and glasses you have and all that stuff. Um, so, and then you've got to look at your local legislation and make sure that, that you're not regulated out of what you want to do. Um, and, and then I would look at insurance and ask your insurance, uh, if, you know, do they, do they cover short-term rental and, and, you know, what's the uptick? It should be, you know, a couple hundred dollars uptick. It shouldn't be thousands and it shouldn't be prohibitive. Uh, if it is, then, you know, you might have a problem in your area. Those are the, before you get too serious, you got to really ask yourself those questions. Is it, is it legal? Can I get insured? And can I endure the expense of, of, um, of furnishing everything? Excellent. Caitlin, I hope that answers your questions. And I'm sure, especially if you're looking to invest as for a short-term rental here in Florida, I know Travis would be able to answer your questions specifically here or itrip.net. You could find out if there's a, a short-term specialist there in your area of Iowa. And if you need a realtor to help you buy it, then let one of us know. We'll be more than happy to introduce you to our network because I know we know connections up in Iowa too. Well, this has been a fun hour. It actually really flew by. I, mm -hmm. I can't thank you enough for all this information, Travis. I, I got notes here and this mm -hmm. is one definitely going to watch the replay to see what I can do about um, getting better at talking with investors on short term rentals and it, refer them to an expert like yourself. Yes. So thank you for your time very much. Thank you. It thank was you so an honor. Yeah, it was an honor and pleasure. I really, really do appreciate the time and the ability to talk about this. There's a lot of information in here. Um, that hopefully will clear things up for people. Cause I know this is mud for so many people, but it's a great business to get into, especially if you've got a professional that can hold your hand through it. Yes. Thanks Travis. Awesome. Appreciate that. You got it. Very cool. Well then um, for everybody who's tuned in and watched the show, whether live or on the replay, um, thank you very much. My name is Eric Larkin with Real Brokers with Hector Shania from Miami, Mich Michelle Belisari from Boca Raton and Amy Burrows from Palm Beach. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you on the next show. Thank Bye you. Bye, guys. Bye.